Hello and welcome to Newspeak, the New Culture Forum's weekly current affairs programme. I'm Emma Webb and this week I'm joined by Senior Fellow of the New Culture Forum and cultural historian Philip Kisseley, as well as Calvin Robinson, GB News presenter and recently ordained Anglican Deacon of Christ Church Harlesden. So let's begin by talking about the most recent news that has been dominating the papers um, over the last 24 hours really, and that is this uh, Cabinet reshuffle, or the uh, I suppose is it a reshuffle? It's not really, is it? Because it's, <laughs> it's the House it's of Cards coming down. I think, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Is what it is. Um, <clears throat> but really, this is this is the um, sort of blowback from the Tory sleaze scandal, um, mm. and particularly pincher the pincher. Mm. Um, so is that what it is, though? I'm not convinced that that's what this is. I think there's been a sustained campaign against the Prime Minister for months by mainstream media, by Ramona's, and th this pincher the pincher thing is the latest. Um, in a long line of instance and it just seems that this is the one that has tripled the deck has toppled the deck rather mm. so do you this think it's fair do you think this campaign against him is fair and justified it's a hard one I'm, i mean i'm not on team boris or anything mm. but we knew what we were getting when we voted for him yeah. we didn't expect a moral man um, did we because i think we thought yeah. we were getting a conservative no, we, and at the very no. least we thought we were getting somebody who believed in free we markets. didn't think we were getting conservative we thought we were getting or libertarian so we were voting against communism we were voting for someone to get brexit done it was as simple as that we hoped we'd have a libertarian mm. in place for the first time in years but i don't think we voted for conservative i mean what, what we've got is someone who it's almost like we're on this train isn't it to uh, hyperinflation and meltdown and boris is not bothered about driving the train he's not even bothered about learning to drive the train he just wants to be called the train driver yeah, you know and does. and and there's not much more to that but there comes a point where you actually have to do your job yeah. you know and that point was actually december 2019 yeah. you know and he hasn't done anything he's just happy to be called prime minister that's how it seems to me no i agree but at the same time all these people resigning now and saying oh it's all over the the morality yeah. of the pincher situation like Really? Please? It was the same in, in to the beginning of 2020. But all a bunch of careerists, yeah. ambitious politicians that just want a safe seat or a safe ministerial role in the next government. The people yeah. who are leaving now know it's safe to leave. They didn't leave a week ago. They didn't leave a month ago. They're, they're following the herd. That's mm. what all everyone does now. It's a, mm. it's a big mob. That's all it is. And it's shameful. How, how much do you think this has to do with the various scandals, whether it is Tory Slee scandals or whether it's to do with all of the stuff about having cake and, and biscuits during lockdown parties and things like that. How much do you think this is to do with that versus how much it's to do with their failure to control inflation? How yeah. badly they did in the by-elections? Was that to do with all of these different scandals or is it something deeper and more fundamental that's, that's behind it? It should be about the politics. It should be about the by-election results and it should be about uh, the ethics and the morality but it's mm. not and they're just painting a fake, a fake picture if they said that that's what they're resigning for I'd, I'd appreciate and respect that mm. but we've got you know they, they can say it's about uh, the way that the response to the Pinterest situation for example they can say that they don't like the rule changing around the uh, eth ethical codes or the ministerial codes um, but at the same time the 1922 committee is looking as we record this right now to mm. change the rules mm. to have another vote of no confidence against the prime minister mm. and he, at the same time he is saying that even if they do change the rules and have a vote a successful vote of no confidence he will not leave so mm. none of them are adhering to the rules i think it really is a plague on both their houses mm. i don't think there's anyone in there that i respect right now but do, do you think that that as with the by-elections you know whether it's a Lib Dem victory or a Labour victory that's actually just a failure on the part of the Conservatives rather than a victory on the part of the opposition party. well it's an anti-conservative vote isn't so it? what how do you see this playing out so if Boris um, is forced to resign if they they change the rules they have another no confidence vote do you think that that will result in him being ousted, ousted? Do you think there's going to be a snap general election? No. And if that is the case, how do you see it playing out long term? Do you think that we're going to end up with a Labour Party government and that that will um, be what people are after as well? Do you think people will protest vote for Labour or do you think they'll just simply not vote at all? In the short term, I don't think they can force Boris Johnson out. But I think the Prime Minister... Is, his legacy is all about how much time he spent in office. It's not about what he's achieved. He's not really accomplished anything. and He's not even proud of no, anything. No, it's, it's about him being prime minister, yeah, as, being as, prime as I said absolutely. before, isn't it? 
I think I think there's a few things. I mean, it's a cumulative effect of all of these things. I, I don't think you can just say it's it's about policy and strategy because there isn't any. You know, uh, I don't think you can just say it's about sleaze because, as, as as Calvin said, if it was about sleaze, they would have been leaving. Yeah. You know, 18 months ago. It's, it's not. It's, it's just they feel as though it's grinding to a halt, and, yeah. and it's the time for for the rats to leave. The sinking ship one of the things that i've noticed in myself over the last few weeks not not just recently but over the last few weeks i'm not looking at the news now for again any kind of strategy or policy because there isn't any i'm actually looking to for, for just purely entertainment value <laughs> so when you know when someone says to boris you know so prime minister you, you've been lying and he says something like well thank you for that question that's really helpful you know it, it's 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 ludicrous the whole thing has become just so ludicrous and in terms of him going no I think the only way he'll go is when people can prize his yeah. fingernails off the front door of number 10. Well it's like Donald Trump isn't it yeah. it's the same situation there'll be a denial of the results and he'll he'll leave kicking and screaming that's the only way to get him out of number yeah. 10 but that's a shame because without losers consent we have no democracy it doesn't mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. unless the losers concede ground and after the last no confidence vote he then came out and gave that whole speech where he said we're going to be conservative now mm. and then everything they've done since it's been windfall tax it's been you know failure to cut taxes yeah. and now that that there is potentially an opportunity for him to possibly switch things around within the cabinet, mm. blame it on the people who have left. Yeah. Do you think that he's going to take that as <laughs> yes. an opportunity? Yes, very so much like, so. Um, like Nadim <clears throat> Zahawi going in to be um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, that he um, is, at least he says that he's in favour of cutting tax. He could but be a very different Chancellor this morning he admitted that before he cuts tax, he's going to have to put it up. So, um, you know, it's it's more of the same. Mm -hmm. and, and his interview this morning was actually on the Today programme. Um, he sounded, he, he's always low key, isn't he? But he sounded tired, defeated, and he'd been in the job literally about 45 <laughs> minutes. Um, so I, it doesn't bode well. It well, Madeline well. Grant compared it to snatching a box of celebrations when all that's left are the bounties. <laughs> and yeah. the, and well, I the love the bounties, they're nobody. my favourite bit. <laughs> well, he, does, he did just want the job, didn't he? You're um, always I, a dissenter, Calvin. <laughs> I, don't, well, I don't think there's any chance of a Conservative government. I, if I look at the, the few Conservatives that were in ministerial roles, uh, albeit junior or in the government. If, you know, Kemi Badenoch has announced that she's not mm. supporting Boris Johnson yeah. as we record this. Yeah. Uh, Lee Anderson is not supporting Boris Johnson. So the actual true Conservatives are not giving him support. Mm. Therefore, we won't have a Conservative government. We might manage to get a free market government. Uh, mm. We should never confuse the two. Um, mm. if, if Nadim comes out and cuts tax, fantastic. Mm. I can't see it happening for the reasons you've just declared. So do you think in that case, they, if, if the solution is being as Conservative as people expected, or maybe wrongly, thought that they would be when they voted for them because mm. you know the Conservative Party basically seemed to be trying to be become like the Labour Party because they think that's a good strategy when the country voted for Conservatives. Which, which always baffles me, we said this last week So we? do you think that they that there is any prospect of them clawing this back before an ex the next general election if the next general election is in a couple of years obviously there could be a snap general election um, if Boris resigns or is forced out what how do you how do you see that playing out do you think if the conservatives um called an election right now they would lose to labor possibly and uh, there's or some kind of evil coalition it'd be an evil coalition it'd be an evil coalition the rumors of mps leaving the tories and defecting to the labor party at this point i don't really see much of a difference but could they win it back absolutely so easy all mm. they need to do is cut taxes mm. and fix immigration the mm. two main problems affecting the most mm. people in the grassroots of this country that's mm. all they've got to do and then win people they? back will they i don't think they will. No. but i mean if they do that yeah. then we get all of that philosophical stuff which is about identity and going back to to what we were and everything that revolved around brexit and you know the the, the words get brexit done is you know is, is is culturally it's the biggest mm -hmm. lie isn't it you know and and if we if we if we had that and if we had a sense of recharging that identity which comes from 
controlling immigration and cutting taxes, all of these things are, are bound together, then, then they would. They'd that's, be bad. That's an interesting one, though, isn't it? Because when we talk about Boris and what Boris's potential legacy would be, the only thing, really, that he can claim to have done is that he, he claims to have got Brexit done. Mm. But as we've seen, we're still in the European Court of Human Rights, which means we can't deal with immigration because mm. they overrule their own courts. Uh, we're not able to, to um, properly sort out our own internal market because the Northern Ireland Protocol is still up in the air. No, and we're, so in, we're in absolute danger of going back into Europe by stealth as well. Mm. You know, So the, the idea of getting Brexit done is so fragile, it's so surface that it's is, laughable. This is what I mean though when I say that people voted for him specifically mm. for that. Because we didn't want a moral leader, we had a moral leader. Mm. There's no one more moral in politics than Theresa May. Theresa May yeah. But she didn't have the guts and the, the cojones to get Brexit done. And we <laughs> thought that Boris would. That's the only difference. Mm. What do you think of the, um, the, the involuntary reshuffling that has occurred? So we've seen um, obviously Zahawi becoming Chancellor, that has opened up education. Michelle Donnellan has moved from Universities Minister to Education. How do you see all of this playing out in terms of the, the ideology of the government? That we've seen some strong contenders resigning, We've seen people like Kemi Badnock, for example, mm. but we're also seeing people moving into posts and potentially moving out of posts where maybe they were causing some trouble or maybe they were doing quite well. Well, I was re reserving judgment because I was hoping if, if Kemi Badnock got a senior ministerial position and Miriam Cates got a senior that was my hope. ministerial <laughs> position and Lee Anderson got one, then I would have supported mm. the government. Mm. That's Dan not, Denny Kruger for health secretary. And that's not going to happen. <laughs> At this point, it's just theatrics. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm sure Michelle Dolan is, is great, but is she going to make a difference in education? Mm. To a degree, do you think that also this shows the weakness of the Prime Minister? So there was some gossip on Twitter that he'd wanted Liz Truss to replace Rishi um, and that Zahawi had said that uh, he'd resign if he wasn't given Chancellor. And so obviously the Prime Minister didn't think he could survive without, Zah if that gossip is true, mm. didn't think he could survive with as big a resignation as the former vaccine minister. Yeah. Um, and so obviously had to bow to that and um, Zahawi managed to basically force his, himself mm. into the role of Chancellor, if, that's, if the gossip is true. So do you think that actually this reshuffle suggests and the positions that people have moved into suggest that the Prime Minister is a lot weaker than he's trying to let on. I honestly don't know. I can't make up my mind on that. I, it's all very intangible though. It it's is. all gossip. It is, but I, it's difficult to see the Prime Minister as anything but incredibly weak, mm -hmm. just given the circumstances. I mean, the 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 uh, it's it's like um it's like an absurd comedy it's it's tragic but it's almost like you know samuel beckett or something mm -hmm. like that there's a there's an element of real tragedy i said before I, I i'm looking at it for for comedy value it's not it's black comedy value and and, and, and it's heartbreaking in lots of ways because I, I think we are heading towards disaster and, and there is nothing that anybody can do about it and if that disaster is economic disaster which it probably will be but also cultural disaster as well with some evil coalition that, mm -hmm. that, that might well take over then it, it, it couldn't be worse. What do you think the long-term impact of that is on our politics and on the culture of our politics that it so much damage has been wrought by not i mean it's not this government as such it's it's a combination of, of factors within our politics that the, there's the potential that rather than voting labor people might simply not vote mm -hmm. um that people have completely lost trust in the system yeah. that um everything with um, all of the public health policies have created so much dependence on the state uh, that it's actually fundamentally changed the character of how we do politics. Yeah. What do you think the long term impact of all this is going to be? Politics is broken. I'm hoping that in the long term we'll get PR or something that, so that we can support the smaller parties and they can make a bigger impact mm. on, our, on our system. Mm. Uh, at the moment that isn't possible. Um, a short term fix might be uh, removing parties from the ballot box. Mm -hmm. that from the ballot paper because that's quite a new uh, change and we should be voting for the local constituency representative not mm -hmm. for the party mm -hmm. and I think that might make a bit of a difference because people would have to get to know who, who mm -hmm. their representatives are and then mm -hmm. we wouldn't have all these shills and these carbon and copies. these that's representatives would that's have to like work a, very hard. like a localist yeah. version of a presidential system mm -hmm. where you're voting for the individual rather but than that's the party. what our system is and was mm -hmm. and that's why it doesn't really work now this is why we have the two-party state and it's not really a two-party state it's a one-party state. But do you state. not think that the cost of that would be 
political chaos. We'd end up with situations like for in places where they have a form of PR, like in the Netherlands, mm. where you have these coalitions that can't possibly work, and mm. then you can't, yeah. you have no functioning system. You've got too many small parties forming coalitions against the larger parties that actually receive more yeah. votes. It, uh, but you, that, that's actually happening now, isn't it? Because we've seen with the by-elections that, that mm -hmm. idea of coalitions is happening. I think one other thing that's going to come out of this is that there's going to be the, the charlatans are, are really going to take this idea of, of um, behavior and virtue and really play with it and play with it very cynically mm -hmm. you know so so the idea that anybody does anything is going to be like you know Parliament's going to be like Twitter, you know, where there are going to be pylons and all of that kind of thing from the left, I think, um, from the identitarian left in particular. So I think there's, when you're talking about politics is broken and there's going to be a new era, I think that there's, there's going to be much more of that. It's going to, it's going to be a, a kind of social media type kind of, oh, you, you know, more, more than it is now, I think. In the short term, do you think the writing is on the wall for Boris? Like if, you, if you had to place a wager on how long he's going to last, it sounded as if you think that actually he's going to, this is like a sort of termite that could survive a nuclear <laughs> holocaust. If thing. I had a 10, a 10 pound note for every time someone asked me, can <laughs> Boris survive this? I'd be rich by now. Por Boris Johnson is the only person that can survive any of these things. He's always got a way to bounce back. People still relate to him. People still like him. That's yeah. the crux of it. Uh, flipping it around on, on its head and asking, could the Conservatives survive this? I'm not sure. And I don't think they deserve to. Mm -hmm. They've had an 80 strong majority to done jack with it. Mm -hmm. They could have made so much change in this mm -hmm. country for good, mm -hmm. and they haven't done anything. So they don't deserve to be in power. That's I don't want to see the Labour Party in power, but the Tories do not deserve it. Anyway. That's an interesting point. because. Uh, uh, Another interesting point is actually I was I was listening to overhearing a conversation before and someone was saying well um, the Conservatives can't survive with Johnson and I thought no it's much worse than that they can't survive with him they can't survive without him either mm -hmm. they're in a you know a cleft stick it's a it's, it's a terrible situation for him but will he survive I'm with Calvin on this I think you know he <laughs> is you know he's, he's a bit he's, of a cockroach yeah he? he is a bit of a cockroach and and uh, I he, Probably, you know, probably. B bizarrely enough, after what's going on, I mean, I was I was at my desk yesterday writing, and the the, the news that you know, the Telegraph thing was coming up time and time again. You know, one's gone, then another's gone. Sunak's gone. And I said, my God, but I was still thinking, yeah, he'll probably be there. I say two two interesting um, things that come off of that. The first is, if it is the case then that Boris sticks around. What is going to happen to all those people that have resigned in the hope of pushing him out? Because those are, we're in those positions for a reason. They were actually the, the best caliber uh, candidates. Is that do you why think? they were there? Is that why they were there? I mean, uh, arguably not. No. But I mean, do you, do you think that. <laughs> well, people get these promotions because they're allies and they're supportive of the leader. They don't get these positions because they're good at what they do, for the most part. Kemi is somebody who is but absolutely she was such a, in such a junior it. position. Mm -hmm. She deserves to be a, a senior ministerial mm -hmm. in a senior ministerial role, but she wasn't. Um, the vast majority of people who've resigned won't be missed, really and truly. The calculations have obviously taken place in the decision yeah. to, to yeah. do this. They obviously think that if they resign, then Boris will have to go, that he'll be mm. forced out. Yeah. And there will, there will be implica political implications if he doesn't go, and then mm. we have a whole new crop right, but of... We saw the same thing last time around with people like Penny Morden. People are so ambitious that they will tuck their tail between the legs and say, oh, I'm sorry, leader, and get on with the job if they're offered a good role. Mm. The, other, the other thing that comes off of this that I think is an interesting, and this, this comes from what you were saying, is that the, the potential that the Conservative Party ends up like the Liberal Party 100 years ago and, and, and just ends up expiring and breathing its last breath and maybe yeah. it has to become some kind of new party, would that be a bad thing or yeah. a good thing? That would be an incredible thing because the Conservative Party is no longer Conservative. Mm. It, it was Liberal for a long time. It's no longer even Liberal. Mm. I don't know what they are other than con-socialist and I don't like that. What so would I, replace it though? What would can you see re like realistically well, two, two, arising from that? Yeah, two different strands. I could see some conservatives getting together and, and rising out of the ashes, but I could also see some liberals and, and people that are allied with conservatives. People like Steve Baker would mm. have a strong position. So mm. that would be interesting to see. Mm. Politics has become about principles versus pragmatism. Yeah. Well, not even pragmatism, is it? It's it's the old Peter Hitchens position, isn't it? The only way you're going to get true conservatism is, is to demolish the Conservative and Unionist <laughs> Party, and, and and I think he's true. I, I think that's absolutely true. Um, Hitchens was right all along. It, it's funny though, isn't it? How how quickly these things have turned round. December two thousand and nineteen. You know, I was thinking, well, the Labour Party is completely finished. 
gone. It's, it's, it's how can it function? It's got two opposing constituencies, middle class identitarians and, and working class northerners, essentially. Uh, and, and never the twain shall meet. And now we're talking very in very similar terms about the Conservative Party with a massive majority, what, two years later, three years later. It's just insane. It's absolutely insane. Um, but the answer is I don't know. We'll see. None yeah. of us really know. I mean, people are still disenfranchised. Just as they were at the Brexit vote, people still feel a massive disconnect between the elites yeah. in Westminster yeah. and the rest of the country. And that hasn't changed. That's across Labour, that's across the Conservatives. Mm -hmm. Until we get politicians that truly represent the people of this country, mm -hmm. we'll be stuck in this rut. And actually, it, it's not just in the UK, it's also in the US as well. This mm -hmm. is yeah, a, this yeah. is beyond, goes beyond yeah. our national politics yeah. as a problem. So let, let's move on to the climate crisis and scare what climate quotes. crisis? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this week we saw Just Oil protesters <laughs> gluing themselves to a Constable painting, which they damaged because I they covered it. Well. They, in fact, they, they did it on the day that I was in Suffolk, in the same area that the Haywain mm. was painted. So I came back to the news; they'd mm. stuck this um, this <sighs> sort of uh, dystopian version of the Haywain across it, and they damaged. The and they damaged itself, it. And they damaged the frame as well. And they spray painted over the floor. And there was this heroic woman. I don't know who she is, but we should try and find out who this lady is. Heroic woman who works for the National Gallery who um, came out and told them basically to shut up and stop talking about climate, that if they were going to protest, mm. they were going to do it silently mm. um, and call the police to try and have them removed. But my question is, how on earth did they manage to, to actually get close enough to the paintings to do that and have the time to cause the damage that they caused well, that you, without somebody intervening. D did you tweet something about if yeah. you breathe on these things? If you, then if you breathe too closely to paintings in the National Gallery, someone comes and taps you on the shoulder and tells you to move back. Yeah, yeah. How on earth? Is it just because people are so afraid of these climate activists that they feel that they can't, they don't physically have the power to manhandle them away? These guys will just bully their way through and the police won't even arrest them. They probably just offer them a cup of tea. It's because the, the, the heritage sector actually agrees with them. I think that's one of the key things. Um, the well, it's thing, the Colston effect, isn't it? That if you're, on the, if you're perceived as on the right side of history, then you can get away yeah. with damaging you, whatever you like. Yeah, you can, you can break the law. It's okay to break mm -hmm. the law because the law's wrong. I mean, one of the things I, I thought of looking at them, the image of, of them there, I mean, it, 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 it was, you could have called it, if you were calling it a piece of installation, you could call it, look at me, you know, just by the looks on their faces, it was, you know, here I am, look at me, you know. They, they always say, <clears throat> I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. I don't want to be doing this. Of course you don't want to be doing this. You know, it's like, it's like you know, Boris Johnson's fingernails on number 10. <laughs> I, I, I won't be here. If, I don't want to be here. It's exactly the same thing, isn't it? But it comes back down to, um, I'll bring it back down to education as well. They are taught to be activists. You know, that's the, the activist impulse in education is huge, it's massive. Mm. It's right across the humanities, right across the arts, and, and, and that's what the, this is virtuous. The arrogance and the disrespect yeah. of it. Well, I'm, first of all, I'm a big fan of John Constable. I know it's considered lowbrow, but I think it's proper is it? good old-fashioned British considered art. Considered lowbrow? Yeah. Um, I think you're operating on an entirely different plane <laughs> of <laughs> whatever circles you move on, regardless of the lowbrow. Myself, yeah. <laughs> but I think... Well, two things need to happen. First of all, we need to stop. So let's stop talking about these people. Stop giving them attention. I didn't see which art they were stuck to because I, I try not to give I think them they the, did it to more the attention than one. that they, they crave. But also, leave them. As in, the police shouldn't arrest them. They shouldn't go anywhere near them. Leave them glued. To just the, to leave the wall them glued yeah. until they have to tear themselves off. Because yeah. it's just they're tantruming, aren't they? Yeah. It's ridiculous. But I mean, if it's going to cause more damage, and practically, if it's going to cause more damage well, to the, the painting, if the security guard should manhandle them out in the first place. Maybe they right. should. Maybe the punishment should be to glue them to something else. <laughs> so they glue the other hand, release the hand that's attached to the painting, cause some damage to the wall and just leave them there all night. <laughs> Take away their cans of spray well, paint and wait for mummy and daddy to come and pick them up. Well, the guy <laughs> who glued his cheek to the, to the road, again, you know, just, just leave him there. Yeah, exactly. you know, you, you, this is yeah. what you did. Take responsibility well, for your actions. We're talking about responsibility for the environment. <laughs> yes. Take responsibility for your actions and yes. get your cheek off. Waste of police time and effort. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the key thing, isn't it? But how, how do you, I mean, you need to stop people from doing this at the first place there needs to be some something to amend the situation that we now have of this Colston effect where people think that if their cause is justified then they're allowed to break the law yeah. 
I don't know how we fix that other than clamping down on uh, enforcing the laws we already have in place. Mm -hmm. we, we keep creating new laws, but they're not followed, are they? So it's pointless. Mm. But there's been so much of this. I mean, the BLM riots was a, a classic example yeah. when, when everybody else was locked down. You know, it was mm -hmm. perfectly okay to do this. You're not going to get COVID yeah. while you're... While you're Swanning around the the, the the capital. I mean, it, it's it's the culture, and, and you've got to, you've really got to work, burrow deep down to change this idea that that it's all about me, and I'm an activist, and I'm so important, and my my you know my contribution here is going to change things. It's just it's it's tackling that narcissism actually mm -hmm. which is at the root of, of of the culture and that's really difficult mm -hmm. it's the double standards of it all that I, I can't stand so i'm trying to take more time to use the left weapons against them so nish kumar has tweeted today um saying, oh the racist tweet yeah nish, yeah. Saying, nish kumar i don't know how you it. i don't really care <laughs> it's anyway, a good nickname but he he uh, said something like it's an out and out racist tweet a rich white man being taken down by asian men and he was celebrating it and mm. i don't know if he was trying to make a joke or not but i thought this what was it what was he blatantly referring racist, to exactly? boris johnson was taken out by, oh, by two asians um so I, I i put underneath i've reported this for racism and i reported the tweet for racism but of course nothing will happen mm. but my point was that we ha it's, it has to be equality mm. if, if certain people get reported for racist tweets everyone should mm. but you know we know that twitter won't do a darn thing about it because it's, mm -hmm. it's again it's perceived as the right kind of racism well, George Jordan Peterson this week has had his, his account suspended on Twitter. Yeah. And I think then Dave Rubin had his account suspended for talking because he, about Peterson oh having his account God. suspended. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it comes back to this thing about hierarchies, doesn't yeah. it? And, it, and it's, it's the victim hierarchy. So if you're perceived to be the... I mean, these... You know, Rishi Sunak's fairly well fixed i think I, I can't i can't really see him as being a victim because of the color of his skin you know it just falls down mm -hmm. at, at, at every every turn and, yeah. and we really have to push back on it That's the there's idea. something there's something so promethean about the whole that all of our politics at the moment I, the last couple of days i've been um this, this seems odd what's the name of that the guy the northern um presenter who does all of the space programs um so I, I don't know what his name is, but he's he's a, he's a well-known broadcaster. He does a lot of space programs. Me, Cox. Oh, Brian. Brian Cox. Cox. Brian so Cox. Thank you, Ollie. Yeah. Oh, the academic. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And um, it just just watching a few documentaries about space and the history of space. You get this. It sound, this sounds almost a bit cliche, but you get this real sense of how ridiculous are so many of these political concerns and crises are that all mm. these people who are th these sort of hubristic little in the context of the universe yeah. in the context <laughs> of the universe on this little rock circling the sun yep. that they that they really think that if if the you know the climate really was going to hell in a handcart that gluing themselves to a constable painting mm. is going to change the world this is part of their sort of not that they believe in God necessarily, but their sort of divinely ordained mission. This is something they must do at the cost yeah. of anything, even sometimes if it costs people their lives. Well, of course, I mean, if you, you, you scratch the surface, they, they don't really feel that. It's an opportunity for to be performative. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to put themselves out there. And, and really, that's all it is. And, you know, thank God there's a climate crisis because there's an opportunity. To, uh, to 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 do things, you know. If if there wasn't, then we'd have to. So know. the reason the reason why I bring up as well the the, <coughs> the greater context of things is because one of the institutions that are pursuing net zero at the cost of things that really matter is the church. Mm. Mm. Um, and the church, uh, it was in the news this week, but the church are borrowing money, so they they're getting themselves into debt um, in order to pursue net zero. And this means putting in expensive. Uh, well, I'd, I guess replacing boilers with expensive other heating systems or whatever um, in parish churches, parish churches that are already close to b being, you know, closed. Mm. So the church seems to be risking bankruptcy in the pursuit of net zero. And it seems that they are concerned with all of these different activist causes at the expense of the church's actual mission to try and bring people to Christ. Mm. No, it's sad when you're borrowing tens of millions of pounds for a cause that isn't directly related to, to your charity status, mm. as in they're supposed to be proclaiming the gospel, not worshiping Gaia, mm. um, <laughs> at the same time as firing parish priests up and down the country because they're saying they can't afford to keep the parishes mm. open anymore. Mm. And, and when you look at who's doing this, we've got, um, we've got the Lord's spiritual, we've got bishops in the House of Lords uh, supposed to be there providing a moral compass for the country, mm. but they're only in there because they have jurisdiction. They're only in there mm. because they represent the parishes. 
the moment they cancel the parishes, mm. they no longer have that jurisdiction, so they should no longer be in the House of Lords. Mm. They're undermining their whole purpose. And at the same time... It could be a silver lining. I oh, know, but they're, cu <laughs> they're cutting people off from the faith. Mm. And the church commissioners have millions and millions, hundreds of millions of pounds, so I don't know why they're funneling money in different routes. And, Where is and this coming from? They, 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 the church seemed to have some kind of self-destructive, you would call it the sort of like uh, it's it Thanatos? Yeah, it's a, it's it's a, a death instinct. mental act of self-harm, isn't it? Uh, it? Is what it is. But they're behaving, yeah. I mean, obviously they're behaving in many ways like a, a big woke corporate under Welby's, um, Welby's rule. They're in a period of managed decline, that's what it is, and mm. trying to mm. wrap it up and make sure it's, it's, it's a good thing to leave behind rather than a tarnished reputation. Mm. You know, they, they really is do. that something that you think they're doing consciously? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So look at who they've recruited for the latest Archbishop of York, uh, a bishop who had experience of closing hundreds of churches. Like, it's not an accident that he got the job. Mm -hmm. That is, well, well it's, terrible. It, it's, yeah. it's so sad on so many levels, not just spiritually, but, but culturally as well. They yeah. want to leave behind that perfectly embalmed liberal corpse. Yeah. Oh, it's such a, such a good turn of phrase. Mm. I love that. Mm. Um, so you were recently ordained into the free... Church yes. England is yes, that free correct? from the state. Mm. So tell us more about what exactly that is. What what is the Free Church of England? Okay. Um, what does it mean to be an Anglican deacon? As, and you know, tell us about a okay. bit about your ordination and why you ended up being ordained into that church rather than into the Church of England. So political battles in the Church of England that I don't really want to go into because I've discussed it enough. But mm. suffice to say, there was no home for me as a conservative in the Church of England. Um, and some bishops got in touch and said, look, we really need to see this through. We want to see you ordained because we feel that you are called to ministry. Mm -hmm. It would be a shame if that didn't happen because mm -hmm. of politics. Um, and they put me in touch with the GAFCON movement, which is a global movement uh, that started, well, it didn't really start, but it really gained traction in 2008 with the Jerusalem Declaration, which was when a group of churches from North Africa, well, from across the African continent and North America got together and said, we don't want this woke nonsense. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go against the Bible because our faith is rooted in the Bible. So we cannot adhere to homosexual marriage or, or re-baptizing people who have supposedly changed sex because it's impossible to change sex because God made them male and female and God made them in his image and God loves them the way that they are created, etc. And they said, look, we need to affirm Anglican formularies, which is the Bible, the ordinal, the Book of Common Prayer mm -hmm. and the 39 articles, and we need to stick to our faith. So they formed this movement, the GAFCON movement, and within the UK there are a couple of different arms to the GAFCON movement, but one of them is the Free Church of England, mm. which actually split, split from the Church of England in 1844, so it's been going for a long while. Um, but they've managed to maintain their theology and their liturgy from 1844. So compared to modern liturgy, which you might see in many evangelical churches, it, it's actually quite high church. But from the, in the day, it was considered quite low church. Mm. So it just shows how, how, how things have changed over time. I, I, I know you don't want to talk about the politics of it all, but how, how did you feel when you, know, when you went your separate ways from the Church of England? Um, well, at first, it was demoralizing because I've just spent all of these years in training and formation mm. and I, I feel a strong calling towards something and that calling was confirmed and then the, the thing was withheld from me at the last minute mm. due to you know not theological reasons or faith reasons but political reasons mm. so that was disheartening to say the least mm. but having been ordained in Christ's church in an expression of Christ's body without all of that political hang-up mm. is actually mm. liberating it's very liberating to just yeah. get on with my ministry yeah. and not have to fight the battles of woke bishops or you know, red tape and bureaucracy and just get on with the job of mm. preaching the gospel. Yeah. One, one thing that I noticed um, at your ordination, and I was honored to be able to Thank be there to coming. see it, um, was how di diverse in the way that the left often use the word diverse, how ethnically diverse and in some ways, maybe not culturally diverse because everyone obviously there is a Christian and mm. part of the movement. Yes but how, how diverse the, uh, the congregation was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, it, I, it's, it was something that you know, piqued my interest that mm -hmm. actually th these more um, conservative or traditional um, churches or uh, practices yeah. appeal um, to those communities mm -hmm. that actually the, the politics of the Church of England appeal to the white metropolitan elite, that they, you know, these bishops all around the dinner table with their friends who think like them and who look yeah. like them and who speak like them. Yeah, ideology trumps everything. So yeah. do you think that actually 
um, <coughs> in terms of the future of the church in an evangelical terms, that, that actually it's those communities where that have been ignored by the Church of England where um, we should be planting churches. Yeah, you're right. So accidentally, we ticked every demographic <laughs> on, on race, on culture, on class, on disability, on everything. But well, the important thing there is the word accidentally. accidentally yeah. Because we, we focused on what's important, yeah. the faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now in, in other parts of the church, we see them focusing on the wrong things. So mm. just today, I've seen online Coventry Cathedral hosting Compline, a pride Compline. Mm. Now, pride in the Christian context is a sin. Mm. No matter how you want to look at it culturally, as in the, the promiscuous, overly sexualized parades mm. that go on, which are clearly counter-Christian, the, the word itself is a sin. So to be naming a religious service after a sin just shows how moved away these people mm. are from the faith and how mm. they've forgotten what they're supposed to be doing. But the, the point I'm making is that Emma's writing that this is mostly, you know, I don't hate to bring race in, into it, but this is mostly white middle class mm. or metropolitan liberal elites that want to appeal to the ethnics or appeal mm. to the gays or appeal mm. to you know certain demographics mm. how do you, you know, let's get those involved that's what they like isn't it mm. it's like when the old people sit around the room and say we need to get more young people involved what do they like let's get some guitars and drum kits and yeah. like, <laughs> people just stick to their faith and stick to the bible mm. and it, that will call people in god well, will do the rest christ yeah. didn't go out to, you know with a, with, a, with a checklist so you know we've got x number of tax collectors but x it, number of lepers and it, prostitutes it's it, was, it, it, it translates it was just a it? Bi natural byproduct well, of the mission it yeah. translates right across everything we've been talking about if the tory party just concentrates yes. on being tories yes. then they'll 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 do a lot better if the monarchy concentrates on being the monarchy, you know, they'll just do a lot better, you know, and, and that's, that's precisely how, it. How, maybe this is a question that is too difficult to answer, but how have we, if it's in our politics or within the church, how have we ended up with this situation where everything is asked about face? Because it's identity politics, isn't it? It's this neo-Marxism that's undermined every single aspect of our way of life that they've got us to focus on the immutable characteristics so often that that's all we see now. Mm. So when, when the church thinks they're doing a good thing by doing a pride complaint, because they think they're being inclusive to people that they feel might be excluded, of course that's a good thing. But they're doing it the wrong way because they're focusing on the immutable characteristic mm. rather than Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. They've forgotten what they're supposed to be focused on. And in the name... They've been distracted. In the name of inclusivity, they are excluding people of such as they yourself. It's they're the excluding way. people who hold traditional yeah. views. Yeah. Well, and those people who hold, hold traditional views happen to be those diverse communities that mm. they talk about but actually often I, I've noticed that when you hear um, clergy talking about those communities the diverse communities it's never about you know this that pe perhaps those are communities where you could um, you could go out and you could do some evangelism it's always we have to respect their culture we have to mm. we have to bring them in uh, as as they are and respect yes. their mm. culture as is Mistake. rather than actually mm. preaching the gospel to them they but I mean, the idea of inclusivity and di diversity, as far as that ideological set is concerned, is just laughable, isn't it? Because they just use identity groups as, as weapons, don't they? Because we see that with the left. We see how they just completely dumped the working class because they, well, they didn't turn up to the revolution, did they? So what do we do? Are oh, we pick on other uh, minority groups and, and now it's trans, isn't it? They're used as, a, as, as an absolute battering ram. With, with the declining numbers in the Church of England, what, what is the future of the Church of England? Do you think the future is outside of the, of the, the affiliated church? Yeah. State affiliated church? I'm trying not to dump on the Church of England too much because I don't want to seem bitter and resentful. It's, it's not about the Church of England, it's about the faithful. And what I'm trying to do now is show people that if they are Anglicans and you know they don't feel comfortable swimming the Tiber, going over to Rome, or Tiber, how do you pronounce it, then there is an alternative. Anglicanism is not synonymous with Church of England. Church mm -hmm. of England is one expression of Anglicanism, but there are other routes available. And that's what I want to tell people really mm -hmm. truly. That's what the Free Church of England, that's what the GAFCON movement is all about, and my church in Halsden, Christchurch Halsden, 8 St Albans Lane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> plug. <laughs> uh, 11 o'clock every Sunday. Um, so t tell us more about your mission in, in Halsden, what you're going to be doing there over the next months, weeks, years weeks, months, years. Yeah, so I mean, it's a tiny, tiny church. It's got a congregation of eight as I've adopted it. So I'm hoping to grow that, grow the numbers of people in the pews, but also grow the, the amount of faith in the place, you know, around Halston. It's an area of deprivation that I know very well. Uh, I, I love it. I've been in that area of London for the last 15 years. So it's, it's kind of already home to me. I'm returning there from my training. Um, but it's a place that needs faith. It's a place where, you know, Halston is a place where people have 
lost faith in the government and the establishment to fix it. Uh, and there was a lot of like, why are they not looking out for us? Why have we been left behind? And I think people are coming now to the realization that we as a people need to be the difference that we want to see. We need to make the difference. Mm -hmm. and we need to come together. And I'm hoping that the church can have a part to play in that. Mm. What role do you think that has to play in, and, and I know this is, a, this is a controversial area of discussion, but the role that Christianity, the role that traditional forms of faith and worship in this country have to play in political rejuvenation. Because communities, whilst I don't, I'm not one of those people who believes that everything is political and everything must be political, communities and things that form communities have political implications. And it is a bit like Burke's little platoons. If mm. you plant these churches mm. in areas where faith is needed and communities grow yeah. and traditional form, traditional views and traditional forms of worship yeah. and um, practices and rituals grow, yeah. that has some political implications. So do you see that um, within a broader context of political rejuvenation? Yeah, I mean, I think you've just answered your question in, mm. your, in your question. That is exactly why we need to do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot be inclusive in the sense that we were talking about earlier. You know this pride Compline in Coventry Cathedral, for example, had LGBTQ plus in their logo. And I saw someone complain that the eye mm. was missing or something else was missing. So <laughs> you can never be quite inclusive enough. So instead, mm. we need to be inclusive in the identity of Christ. So we need to play mm -hmm. people at their own game. Mm. So if you want to play identity politics, sure, our identity is Christian. Our identity is rooted in Christ. Come along and we'll, we'll include you in that. But we won't water down our values. We won't take on board your culture or your ideals or your values, these mm. are the ones that we subscribe to and you are welcome mm. to come and choose it's, to subscribe to them too. It's the Pauline quote that everybody knows, there is neither Jew nor Greek, yes, slave nor free yes, man. Yes, Galatians. So, so um, given that I imagine, um, just before we wrap up, that uh, some of our viewers, possibly a lot of our viewers, will be atheists, what would you say to those viewers about your mission, why why this is important, and, and maybe how they should respond or engage? I suppose because we always have to latch onto a set of values. Um, we cannot be valueless. We will always have values. So it's a case of which values do we want. Mm -hmm. This used to be a Christian country with Christian values, mm -hmm. and that worked for us for a long, long mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And now those values have been eroded and diluted to the point that people are looking around for other values. Mm -hmm. The far left are saying, you know, we've got the, the climate crisis, that, that's a set of values or you know, through Extinction Rebellion, and then there's mm. the politically hostile Black Lives Matter and people like that have sets of values you can subscribe mm. to. But mm. actually, the majority in the cities is Islamic values. Mm. Do you want this to become an Islamic country? Do you want us to have Sharia law? Do, is mm. that the set of values you want Great Britain to be uh, adhering to? I don't, I don't think it's compatible with British values, but mm. then, as I say, British values are being watered down and eroded, mm. and they will be replaced with other values unless we uh, reaffirm I mean, our Christian values. I mean, I mean that's, that, that's one thing, isn't it? If you, if you asked people how, how you would describe British values now, I, my guess is eight out of 10 people would be very challenged, you know, well, I don't know, I don't know what, you know, they wouldn't think about the church, they wouldn't think about the common law, they wouldn't think about parliament, they wouldn't think about all the democracy. Mm. You know, um, because those aren't the things really that are that are presented as British values. You know, I'm. You know, if, if I was thinking about twenty um, first century British values, I'd be really challenged myself. There's a difference between abstract values and things that you might have affection mm. for, mm. Um, and I think that's part of the change. That's the response to uh, increasing diversity and mass migration. That mm. it's it's actually it's actually why the island, why place, mm. is so important, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. So um, just before we wrap up, do you want to um, remind the viewers of where they can go if they want to come to one of your services? Cool. So you can go to evangelicalcatholics.co.uk, put your email address in there, I'll send you all the information. But it's Christ Church Halston, five minute walk from Halston Station, underground or overground, 11 a.m. every Sunday. Are you going to be going? Uh, well, if, <laughs> if, if the trains are running, then, uh, then I'll certainly be fantastic. But who knows? Who back knows? Back? Oh, yeah, definitely. Cool. Definitely, I'll be back. So thank you so much. It's um, only from Leeds. Yeah, it's only from Leeds. <laughs> yeah, you've got no excuse. Yeah, it's probably easier know, to get a train from Leeds than yeah. within London. So thank you so much um, for joining us. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Calvin. Um, we hope to see you next time on Newspeak. Please like and subscribe, and we will see you there. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel, and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. 
Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.